Well, let me, let me say by way of introduction while we're sort of waiting. Uh, I'm Steve Max, and I'm a, uh, an, an honorary vice something of DSA, and have been trying to help out with some of the uh, educational materials and the, uh, uh, the webinar series that the DSA is doing for uh, some YDS people, but mainly DSA people, uh, on how to improve the uh, the, the, the organizing capabilities. Uh, I also work for the Midwest Academy, uh, which is a uh, school that trains uh, organizers uh, from the most local level on up to national organizations. I, I, won't, I won't bore you with the details of that. Uh, and uh, also uh, work locally uh, here in New York with local Democrats and a number of other uh, organizations. Uh, and, and this is my wife, Lynn, over here and friend uh, Barbara Raft <coughs> come for the occasion. Uh, so we're going to take a, uh, a kind of uh, far-ranging view of some of the economic questions that are uh, facing the uh, country today and facing capitalism today, uh, and particularly try to look at it uh, from a, a socialist point of view. Let's see if this is working. So where is the sound in this thing? Got to have sound, folks. Not good. Well, if something is going to go wrong with the sound, it will. There's another sound tap here. Let me. This is the school speakers. Let me see how this works. Anybody recognize the music? Yeah. Uh, what is it? International. Uh, and what is that? Tell folks, turn around. Oh. The International is, uh, you know, originally like an English work, a French, French work song uh, sang by, you know, workers or to inspire and to sort of profess these ideas. Socialism was later adopted into many different languages. Uh, the Russians used it as their national anthem. And uh, it's used all over the world. Today. Well, I just thought we'd keep the tradition going. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so this is part one. Where did the middle class come from? But life improved in America when three great social movements created a middle class. I don't know why we can't center this, but we can't. Anyway, created a middle class. And they were the labor movement, the civil rights movement, the women's movement. And so we want to understand, and this is, this is particularly key to thinking organizationally, that the middle class wasn't created by the economy, it wasn't created by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, it was created in, in struggle by these social movements. Uh, before the labor movement in the 1930s, if you were an industrial worker, uh, you were considered to be poor people. And the uh, build, building up the wages and the benefits and health care and, and, and all of that uh, was what the labor movement did. And then the other two movements uh, brought people of color and women uh, more or less, mostly less, uh, but more than they had been uh, up, up to that level. So it should not be surprising that as the movements decline and as political activism declines, the middle class declines with it because the organizations that used to defend it, uh, which were the organizations that created it, uh, are, are less powerful than they were or are gone.
don't, don't let anyone tell you elections don't matter. Or, well, then who are the 1% and how did they get there? Well, here's a typical specimen. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the president of Wells Fargo, the biggest bank uh, in America. Now, actually, he's more in the top 0.1%. Uh, but still, uh, not as wealthy as our mayor uh, of New York. Uh, this guy is only worth $50 million. Our mayor is worth, uh, what, what is it, Lynn, that he's worth? $37 billion? Right, so so uh, th th he, he's pretty much at the bottom of the 1%. And, and in fact, when we talk about the 1%, there is more difference between the bottom of the 1% and the top of the 1% than there is between the bottom of the 99% and the top of the 99%. And, and as you get up in the 1%, the wealth is more and more concentrated up there. Now, what the uh, richest 1% owns of the wealth uh, compared to what the middle class owns is absolutely astonishing. But how could that have happened? Right, for a while, we were all doing better together. And you can see in these years on the graph from the end of World War II uh, up until the middle 70s, Oh, this, this doesn't show you wealth, it shows you the increase in wealth, and the wealth for the bottom 20%, the middle 20%, and the 95th percentile were all increasing more or less equally. People were getting richer at kind of the same rate, which doesn't mean that the poor got richer. They got less poor at kind of the same rate uh, until the 1970s when you can see this begins to diverge more and more. Now, a number of key things happened uh, in the 1970s. They were a turning point. The economic stimulus from World War II ran out. Now, you guys remember in the 30s there was the Great Depression and people couldn't buy anything because they didn't have money. And then there was World War II, 1940, and there was full employment uh, and pay went up and people had money but they still couldn't buy anything because there wasn't anything to buy. It was all going into war production. In 1945, the war ends, and there's 15 years of pent-up demand uh, in the economy and people who have money to buy stuff. So there is a big boom that runs for roughly 20, 25 years uh, after World War II, in addition to which the industrial base of all of the other parts of the world had been bombed to rubble, uh, and the U.S. got the job of reindustrializing the world. Uh, and then uh, Volkswagens and Toyotas began to show up here, and we discovered that we had finished industrializing the world, and now they had all the new stuff, and we were still working with plants from the 1920s. That was the end of the steady rise of family income, the, the mid-1970s, uh, and after that it gets much more sporadic. It keeps going up, but up and down. Deindustrialization begins. Factories start moving to the Sun Belt, uh, the southern tier in the United States, and then from there to the Mexican border, and then across the Mexican border, and then to China. Union membership declines correspondingly, and with it the political power of the unions. Then we had the fiscal crisis of the cities when all major cities went broke, largely because of financial manipulation by the banks, but broke nonetheless. Nixon goes to China in 1972, and the deputy premier, Chu Enlai, tells him, please don't eat the lotus leaf, which is not as philosophical as it sounds. It was a purely decorative thing on the plate. <laughs> then the trade balance goes down. We'll start talking about that in a few moments. And the group stagnation and economic growth <laughs> begins in the mid-70s, and we'll talk about that in a few moments. So getting super rich then meant war on the middle class.
So the war on the middle class began because the 1% and large corporations always wanted more, just as Senator Sanders has said. Now, there was a time when clothing in this country was made in American factories by union workers, uh, and the workers made a decent salary, and the companies made a decent profit, uh, and you may remember this uh, song. So always look for the union label. It says we're able to make it in the USA. How many of you actually can remember that? No? Let's say it. My wife does, right, and Barbara. Right? It, just, it, just shows you how, it just shows you how long ago it was uh, that this was true. But the, uh, the, the Lady Garment Workers Union uh, used to hire uh, airtime and play this song. But the factory owners always wanted the workers to work faster. All right, girls. Now, this is your last chance. If one piece of candy gets past you and into the packing room unwrapped, you're fired. Yes, ma'am. Let her go! got a big idea. But productivity went up. That is, you can make more stuff in an hour at lower cost, but real family income didn't go up. There was not more money in the paycheck. Uh, and that meant extra profit between here and here. So here's the problem. Ro robots can do everything people can do except for one thing. What is that? Think. Well, we don't even know if that's true. Yeah, on the back. Uh, buy the products. They can't buy the products. Right? They can't eat candy and they can't buy cars. It turns out it's easy to build a factory. It's easy to make a product. It's hard as hell to sell the product when so many jobs have been taken by robots. So then the 1% had another great idea. Make the stuff in even lower wage countries and sell it here. So while U.S. industry rusted, American companies began to bail out. This is a steel converter. Uh, 1989. Right, uh, the New York Times starts talking about uh, the beginnings of globalization. Right, more and more companies shedding national identity, no longer so dependent on the economy of the United States. They're talking about the beginnings of globalization, or at least the re-beginnings of it. So our goods production begins to fall. Uh, Slow-wage service jobs begin to rise, and. You know, as, as of now, uh, Business Week is saying that uh, manufacturing uh, is only at 63% of the level it was in 07, uh, that there are 20,000 fewer plants operating today, manufacturing plants, uh, than there were in 07. Well, then what happened? Then the devil showed up. <laughs> People got distracted. They started saying, look at those immigrants, look at those gays, the welfare cheats, the unions, the school teachers, look at those women's clinics. Meanwhile, they were getting their pockets picked. Right? New data from the Commerce Department shows employment pay is down to the smallest share of the economy since the government began collecting the data in 1929. That's the extent to which the pockets got picked. 
As our industries withered, uh, we began to import more than we sold to other countries. And you can see that here as this red line goes down. Now what happens if you buy more than you sell over a long period of time? Say it again? You build up a deficit. You build up a deficit, you go into debt. Exactly so. So while employment shrank, Americans went into debt. Corporations borrowed, government borrowed, investors borrowed, families borrowed, students borrowed. And we became a, a debt economy, right, in which our debt is now larger than the whole economy. So these red bars, going back to 1970, show you the size of the whole economy, the gross domestic product, and the blue bars show you the total of all debt. And now that's government debt, student debt, mortgages, all debt in the economy, but you can see how much larger this has become. Now, debt is bad for us, and it's bad for cities and states, but debt is great for banks. Right? And this is what we need to understand about the banking system, the socialists. Right, debt is the product that they sell on which to make their profit. And consequently, it's in the bank's interest to keep wages and taxes and scholarships low in order to force people and governments to borrow. Right? If everything was going smoothly, oh, they wouldn't be making the money on interest for their loans. We're using interest in two different ways here, right? self-interest and financial interest. And sure enough, bank profits are on the rise. FDIC says banks posted a 37.6 billion profit during the third quarter of 2012. That's the most recent that we have, data that we have. Now, it used to be that banks raised money to loan out to other activities. Uh, exploration, railroads, all of this good stuff. Anybody recognize this? Yeah, that's, that's a computer, and, that, and that, that, that's a pretty good one because it has a keyboard, but you see it also has a card reader over here, because it, it used to be before the keyboard that the way you got information into the computer was to punch holes in cards and feed them in here. Yeah, but today, banking and debt and speculation has become an industry in its own right, and finance has surpassed manufacturing as a source of profit. Now this shows you the percentage of all profits that came from manufacturing starting in 59. And you can see what's happening there. And now look at the percentage of all profit that comes from finance, banking and speculation, the stock market, and you can see the turnaround there. Now a basic problem of capitalism is that the financial system generates vast amounts of wealth for the 1%, and all of it has to be reinvested at only the highest rate of profit to make still more wealth. And this is the fundamental socialist critique of, of uh, what's wrong with capitalism in, in, in the financial sense. Uh, and that is that we, we're, we're accustomed and we're always told that there isn't enough money. In fact, we're told that there isn't enough money and there aren't enough products. In fact, the answer to just about anything we want is that there, there, there isn't enough. We all have to make do with less. We have to make intelligent choices. That's the phrase they use. We have to make intelligent choices. And, and we are given to believe that we are living in conditions of scarcity when the actual problem is just the opposite. The actual problem is that the system is generating more wealth than the 1% can invest, and so they do crazy stuff with it. And it's creating more products than the rest of us can buy, and they can't sell it, and so we have unemployment. Right? The problem is a superabundance of everything. It isn't a scarcity of anything. Uh, and that is a fundamental socialist critique of what is happening here. Any questions about that? Okay, this is something we've got to be crystal clear about. There's not too little, there's too much. It's just that the wrong people have it. As manufacturing declined, financial speculation brought higher and higher profits. Now, there are not just three, not just one economy, there are three related economies. There's the real economy, which we live in. There's the imaginary economy, where people bet on the future value of pieces of paper on Wall Street. Uh, and then there is the super fictitious imaginary economy, where wealth is created with a computer. 
And these two overlap very closely. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. So what happens is, as there begins to be more wealth accumulating than can be invested in factories and transportation and in other heavy stuff that, that, that has a real, it's made of steel, uh, financial speculation grows. The stock market is a good example. This shows you millions of shares traded daily on Wall Street and how that booms up. Trading on the currency markets where you're gambling that the euro will be worth a few cents more tomorrow than today if you buy enough of them. The derivatives, these are uh, bad uh, stocks backed by mortgages. Or mortgages bad by, never mind, you get the point, it's right here. Uh, these are alternative investment products. Mostly fake stock and Ponzi schemes sold to small investors, but you can see how they are increasing 05 to 2012. Step one. We write a check for $10 million, hand the check to a Wall Street bank, and ask them to make us a CDO. Step two. They create the CDO using risky stuff. Very risky stuff. Extremely risky stuff. Step three. Other investors commit hundreds of millions of dollars to the CDO. Step four. We bet against the CDO using a credit default swap. Step five, the housing market crashes, the CDO's value drops to zero, our bet pays off, and we make hundreds of millions of dollars, and before you can say step six, we're rich. We're gonna bet against the American dream. We're gonna be on the winning team. Purchase risky debt on a massive scale. Then place a bet that the debt will fail. Hundreds of millions for Magnetar. The economy collapsing like a dying star. No one will know till it's on NPR. And who cares? It's time to hit the town. This sucker could go down. The housing market's losing steam And all we gotta do To make our dreams come true Is bet against the American dream Now as if that wasn't enough Then the 1% discovered that banking is magic the 1% used to make profits by paying labor less than the value of what it produced. And that wasn't exactly fair, but at least there were jobs. Now they make money by magic. Now how is the trick done? Well, to start with, our view of banking may be a bit out of date. You remember this, you see it every Christmas, Jimmy Stewart, it's a wonderful life. Out of date view of banking, watch. No, but you're, you're, you're thinking of this place all wrong, as if I had the money back in a safe. The, the money's not here. Well, your money's in Joe's house, that's right next to yours, and in the Kennedy house, and Mrs. Maitland's house, and, and a hundred others. Uh, you're lending them the money to build, and then they're going to pay it back to you as best they can. Now, what are you going to do, foreclose on them? I... Right, but that was Hollywood. Real banks don't just lend out the depositors money. They create money with a few keystrokes on the computer, and we pay them to borrow money they don't actually have. And that's one of the best kept secrets of the 1%. Now this is a uh, little handbook on how to understand money that the Federal Reserve Bank put out. And listen to what they say. Well, I'll read it, you can't see it for some reason. They say then, Bankers discovered that they could make loans merely by giving their promise to pay or banknotes to borrowers. In this way, banks began to create money. Transaction deposits are the modern counterpart of banknotes. It was a small step from printing notes to making book entries crediting deposits of borrowers. For example, Right, we now know that in the 0809 credit crisis, the Federal Reserve made 7.7, .7, almost $8 trillion in loans to banks. Now this is their uh, balance sheet for that year, and it says that if you include the value of their buildings, uh, they have just a little short of $1 trillion. 
Right. So that's what they had, that's what they wanted. So where did the 7.7 .7 trillion come from? Then the banks that they fed loaned the money to took the magic money and they loaned it out uh, to businesses, to consumers, to whoever would borrow it, students. And they made $13 billion of profits on the loans. And the Times ran this story, banks prepare for big bonuses. Everyone on Wall Street fixated on the number, the haul and cash and stock will run into many billions of dollars. <laughs> And it didn't end there. Right, this is from the New York Times, 10, 13, 12. The Fed said it would expand its holdings of mortgage-backed securities by about 40 billion a month. These purchases joined the bank's earlier commitment to buy about 45 billion in treasury securities, which has now been extended indefinitely. The Fed will credit banks that sell the bonds with new reserves, essentially creating money as it now does in purchasing mortgage bonds. Right, so let, let us be clear when anybody tells us there is no money. Right, the answer is that they just print it. They just don't print it for us. Right, they print it for the banks, and the banks loan it to us. Uh, and then, as Jimmy Seward said, we pay it back the best we can. Right, but there is, the money is not real. Right, and that, that is another fundamental idea that we as socialists should keep in our head Although I find it impossible to even have this discussion with people, and I explain all this, and I say, look, it was in the New York Times, and they say, yes, you're right, the rich should pay their fair share of taxes. And that's not the subject at all. Right? The subject is that the banks create money, but nobody can grasp that. Now, there's nothing illegal or conspiratorial here. Right? It's simply the way the banking system works. It's always worked that way. Uh, it's just that it's being done on a larger scale now. There are some in the, uh, on, on the far right, uh, Ron Paul and those, who, who, who think that uh, this is some kind of trick or conspiracy. Uh, it's not. It's business as usual. Well, the 1% got rich. We paid the price when it all crashed in 2000. <laughs> With trouble on Wall Street, the 1% started looking for other ways to make money. And now they're coming after the middle class for profit. Public facilities sold to investors, privatization of schools, water supplies, sewage systems, the parking meters in Chicago were sold to a private company, teachers, firefighters, and police laid off, tax cuts for the rich, service cuts for us, a tax on union wages, unemployment benefits held hostage, mortgage foreclosures, and Wall Street wants the Social Security Trust Fund with the $2.5 trillion in it. So what is the 1% doing with the money? Right? Are they really the job creators as we keep being told that they are? Well, they have money. Profits are up. Third quarter of last year, profits, the last we have figures for, up $1.7 trillion. Uh, over a year ago, after-tax profits hit the greatest percentage of the economy in history. So this is percentage of the total economy that is made up by profits, and this is the percentage made up by wages. Corporations and investors simply aren't short of cash, right? It's not true there isn't enough. And they won't invest in jobs if they're given more money, which even the liberals seem to believe that they will. The U.S. corporations are sitting on cash reserves of a historic level. The Federal Reserve reports that corporate cash balances in the last quarter of 2012 were 1 $1.9 trillion. Right? That's what they're sitting on uninvested. Well, they have most of it in U.S. Treasury bonds, uh, but, but that's convertible. <laughs> Right. They're sitting on a pile of cash, and they're not investing it, and they don't need more. <clears throat> Business Week remarked, U.S. private capital markets are loath to tie up their billions in factories and machinery. Right. It's not a secret. So why is that? Factories can pay 
fail. Factories, how, what makes them fail? And where do the profits come from? Consumption. What does that mean? Who said consumption? Yeah, all right, so what does that mean? What do they have to do to make the consumption happen? Pay wages. Well, they have to do that, but that's less their concern. Yeah? Create a market. They have to create a market. You have to sell the stuff. Right? That, that, that's, the, that's the big hang-up. <clears throat> it's easy to make it. As I said, it's hard to sell it. <clears throat> right, if you invest in, uh, in uh, derivatives or, 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 or futures or, or any of that phony stuff on the stock market, you're gambling that it's going to go up by itself. Now, sometimes it doesn't, but you don't have to worry about selling it. And this raises a question. Right? Could something be really seriously wrong uh, with the economic system of capitalism? Now, you probably guessed what I think. What, what we're looking at is a long-term decline uh, in economic growth. And you can see it beginning here in the 70s and going on through to the, the 2000s. Um, you can't even see my last bar. This thing has cut it off, but it goes up to 2012. So we are now in the fifth straight decade of stagnation in the growth rate. Uh, and, and this is not only true in the United States. The numbers are different, but the same pattern is evident in Western Europe and in Japan. So what this means is that the entire mature capitalist world is bemired in stagnation in the rate of growth. Right? Despite the vast amounts of wealth that are being created, oh, they can't get the growth rate up because they're not able to invest this in, in productive stuff oh, other than financial wizardry oh, because they're making too much of everything already and they can't sell it. Right? And then there are imports from the parts of the world where growth is taking off. I mean, think about it this way. When Henry Ford invented the Model T, uh, he had an entire country to fill up with cars. Uh, and it took him from the early 1900s until just after World War II to fill it up with cars. And then it was full. But then the suburbs were invented, and it was discovered that everybody needed two cars. So he got to fill it up again, uh, and then it was full. Now it's full. Right now, you can't sell a car unless somebody has turned 18 or somebody is replacing an old car. On the other hand, China can be filled up with cars. And it is, but they're not being made by Henry Ford, because he's dead, among other reasons. But you get the point. Industrial growth projections for the whole industrial world, 1.4% uh, for this year. Now let me introduce Nouriel Roubini, right? an economist for the International Monetary Fund. He worked at the World Bank. He worked at the Fed. He worked for the President's Council of Economic Advisors. He's now a senior treasury advisor. And he runs a company that will tell you how to become a billionaire if you already are a billionaire. And this is what he said. He said, so Karl Marx, it seems, was partly right in arguing that financial globalization, intermediation run amok, and redistribution of income and wealth from labor to capital could lead capitalism to self-destruct. Now, he said it. I didn't say it. DSA didn't say it. He said it. Actually, he said it. <laughs> the economy has never been stable, and it never will be. Crisis will always be part of our capitalist system. This is Thomas Honig, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. We didn't say it, he said it. So did the 1% create the economic situation, or did the situation create the 1%? Anybody want to take a crack at this? See who hasn't spoken. OK, take a crack at it. I think the 1% created the economic situation. Thinking you see in the 70s that profits were being squeezed and that they funded a lot of money in the lobbyists in order to get these uh, 
regulations all worked down in order to get these tax breaks. Uh, you see the amount of corporate lobbyists just go up tremendously from the early 70s to the early 80s. Okay, all those things are true. Anybody have another view? Yeah. By economic situation, do you mean the current state of the economy or the economic system? The system. Oh, um, That's a good then, distinction, yeah. Then I would say that the system created the 1%. What would you say? Um, I would say the capitalist system um, created the one percent, but not directly. I mean, first you have to realize that there's always been people at the top of the pyramid because I think that's the way capitalism is structured. Um, so you always have a small portion of people um, controlling the wealth. But I think um, as that system has been perpetuated and has gone on, wealth has become even more concentrated, and concentrated, thus creating that ultra-rich 1% that we have now. Okay, so are, are you implying that there is a dialectical relationship between the 1% and the system? Right, okay. All right, it was both, right, I think is what, what we're getting at. I think you put it in a better way. All right, so what about those jobs? The employment situation last month, the number of full-time jobs needed 23 million. Not, not likely to occur. But the problem is worldwide. The International Labor Organization at the UN talked about unemployment, but the, but the significant thing is the underlying part there. What they said is that more than 1.5 billion workers, slightly over half the world's workforce, are in vulnerable situations, by which they mean that half the world's workforce can't find what we would consider to be a regular full-time job. And this is equally distributed in developed and underdeveloped countries, and they don't say it, but my view of it is that it is a function of overproduction uh, already existing, right? That, again, there's, there's too much stuff being made. Uh, it's easy to increase the output, <clears throat> and there's not full-time work for half the world's workforce which is why we should not believe we're going to have full employment here uh, anytime soon. Now count the number of human beings in this factory. How many do you see here? Anybody see two? Sorry? No, that's a machine right there. <laughs> no, I think it's one. I think that's how many people are actually working there. The new technology means that we all need to stay in school longer, work shorter hours, and retire earlier, and that most new jobs will be in the public sector. And this is exactly the opposite of what we're being told. Right? We're all told that we have to work harder, we have to work longer, go out and get two jobs. Right? The problem is there aren't enough jobs, uh, and there don't need to be more jobs. Right? Human needs can be met with the existing number of jobs. The labor of every adult on earth for 40 hours a week is no longer required from the technological point of view, except in human services. Right? We can all take in each other's wash and do that kind of thing. But, but for absolute necessity, it's not there. And so this is what a healthy economy is going to look like in the future. Now, from a socialist point of view, making this work is entirely a political problem. It's not a technological problem. Uh, but even good liberals seem confused about what needs to be done. Sort of a follow-up, Mr. Blumenthal. You've talked about you want to incentivize small businesses. Tell me something. How do you create a job? A job is created, and it can be in a variety of ways, by a variety of people, but principally by people and businesses in response to demand for products and services. And the main point about jobs in Connecticut is we can and we should create more of them by creative policies. And that's the kind of approach that I want to bring to Washington. Okay. Recent polls have shown a fifth of Americans can't locate the U.S. on a world map. Why do you think this is? I personally believe that U.S. Americans are unable to do so because uh, some people out there in our nation don't have maps and uh, I believe that our ed education, like such as in 
South Africa and uh, the Iraq, everywhere like such as. And I believe that they should, uh, our education over here in the U.S. should help the U.S. Um, or should help South Africa and should help the Iraq and the Asian countries. So we will be able to build up our future for our children. Thank you very much, South Carolina. <laughs> he won. She was only third runner-up. They both have the same program. Robert, what can we do about jobs right now, today? Now, this is uh, Bill Gross, the manager of the world's largest bond fund and a Republican billionaire. And he says, capitalism in its raw form can't pull us out of this hole. Now, he said it, I didn't. He suggested a direct government jobs program saying putting a shovel in the hands of somebody can be productive. Now, what did he mean? He said raw form capitalism, but isn't he part of the 1%? This is what he meant, to shovel in somebody's hands, right? This is the Works Progress Administration during the New Deal, the Roosevelt years. And, and this is when the government itself became the employer of many, many unemployed workers. And you see one of the projects here uh, where they were repairing this road. Now, what I love about this particular photo is that the WPA wasn't just for manual work. It was also for artists, photographers, musicians, and here you see the unemployed artist drawing a picture of these guys uh, while they're working, uh, which will probably end up in a mural in a school or a post office that the WPA built. But that was the small stuff. Roosevelt believed in huge projects that paid for themselves, and he created millions of jobs, and it didn't cost the government anything in the long run, which wasn't that long. Grand Cooley Dam, right, jobs project. Right, green hydroelectricity that they sold and that pays for the dam. Hoover Dam was a jobs project. The Tennessee Valley Authority was a jobs project. Right, now these things were all good in their own right, but they were started to create jobs. That was what they were for. LaGuardia Airport here in New York. The Triborough Bridge. The San Francisco Bay Bridge. The Lincoln Tunnel. But today, solutions have to be even bigger and bolder than these, but they can be along similar lines conceptually. This is a, a wind farm, right? We can, we can do the same kind of thing with those dams uh, with a wind farm and have it pay for itself by generating electricity. Solar-powered electric car charging facility. This one's in Japan. We tend not to have them. A stadium with 8,844 solar panels right, in Taiwan. This is here in New York. Right? It's an experiment in the East River to generate electricity with underwater turbines. We can magnify that. A solar-powered railroad in Belgium. These are the kinds of things that we could have as public works projects to create jobs that would pay for themselves. Solar power generating station. The oil is the fuel of the engine of freedom, and that's dead on accurate right between your eyes. That's not spin, that's not deception, that's not in any way painting pictures. Oil is the fuel of the engine of freedom, and there is no replacement for it. There is no substitute for it. Okay, so what is the purpose then of all of this green energy stuff? The purpose is an expanding government. Right, so, <laughs> so to get there, we first have to defeat those guys, right, which is why so many of us took a deep breath and, and, and worked for Obama in this last election because we knew we had to defeat those guys. So here is my program for the Obama administration, and I'll wrap up in a moment, uh, and I invite you to write your own. Massive green jobs programs, immigration reform with the DREAM Act, 
education as a right, federal money for states and cities, because they're going to print it anyway, they might as well print it for us, defend teachers and public service worker unions, protect Social Security and Medicare, tax the 1% and the big corporations. The Republican Party is now an extreme right-wing party. It is owned by their campaign contributors and the millionaires and billionaires of this country. It doesn't surprise me. But the American people have been very, very clear on this issue. When you talk about deficit reduction, at every single poll that I have seen, what this election is about is the American people are saying no. We're in the midst of a horrendous Wall Street caused recession. We are not going to cut Social Security, which, by the way, as Harry Reid just reminded us, has nothing to do with the deficit. We're not going to cut Medicare. We're not going to cut Medicaid. Yes, at a time when the wealthiest people in this country are doing phenomenally well and their tax rates are low, we are going to ask the rich, we are going to ask corporate America, one out of four corporations in this country, profitable corporations, pays nothing in taxes. We're losing over $100 billion a year because of these tax havens in the Cayman Islands that corporate America and the wealthy take advantage of. Yes, we're going to do deficit reduction, but we will be damned, especially after this election, if we're going to balance the budget on the backs of the elderly, the children, the sick, and the poor. And I hope very much that the Democrats stand tall on this issue. Okay, we have about nine minutes for any points people would like to make. Yeah. Others. Yeah. Um, can you maybe talk about um, the role of banks leading up to the 70s before a lot of legislation um, was put in place? Like, for example, uh, the limitations of commercial investment bank and the changes that took place in legislation um, after the 70s that changed okay. the things that they could do in investing it, outside it, of the, re the, uh, the real economy. It, it goes back to that Jimmy Stewart clip. Uh, because what happened there was that, that so many savings banks that people had their own little money in uh, failed during the Great Depression uh, that Roosevelt got the Glass-Steagall Act passed through Congress uh, that said that savings banks could only make the safest kinds of loans, which were home mortgages. Uh, and when you took out a mortgage under that system, you had a, a, a 20 or 30 year relationship with that bank. Right? That bank kept your mortgage. And they didn't want any problem from you. They didn't want you not to pay. They didn't want to take over the house. They didn't want to have to hire somebody to go and mow the grass. And so they only gave out the mortgages on a very conservative basis to people who they thought had the money to pay. Then, during the Clinton administration, the Glass-Steagall Act was repealed. And now any bank could do any kind of speculative work it wanted to. Oh, there was no longer any distinction between savings banks uh, which we call commercial banks, and the other banks, which I can't remember what we call them, uh, that are for pure speculation. So at that point, what began to happen was that the banks would make mortgages, and then they would immediately sell the mortgage to a broker uh, who would sell it to a uh, stock investment company or some group of speculators. So the banks no longer held on to the mortgages for 30 years. If they held them for 30 days, that was a lot. Uh, and the idea was that you made as many mortgages as you could because you could sell each mortgage at a profit. And you didn't have to worry about them getting repaid. The person who bought it from you got repaid. Then the people who bought the mortgages from the bank put them together into stock certificates. right? And they said, this certificate is backed by this bundle of mortgages. And you can buy the certificate uh, and you'll get interest on it uh, when these people pay their mortgages. But by then, nobody could figure out whether the mortgages were good or bad, and they tended to put the bad ones in there because they were going to unload it on somebody else. And that was basically what happened. Yeah. I was just wondering, I mean, looking, for instance, like the Atlas government and Britain, you know, post-war, as well as FDR here in the United States, I mean, we're at virtual unemployment, at least, you know, for, for a pretty good while there, after Works Progress Administration and these things. Um, 
but now you, it seems that even from social democratic parties in Europe and things like this, you hear this, this talk about how the old social democratic model doesn't hold up with expanding globalization. So what is what are the what are the differences with today's economy uh, on how to reach some type of state virtual uh, full employment? Well, I, I don't think it is possible to reach a state of full employment uh, uh, under the existing system. Now, if if folks took my advice, imagine imagine if you will uh, that Congress were to pass a law. I said imagine that uh, it, in 20 years it would be illegal to burn fossil fuel. Uh, except for airplanes. If they passed that law, what would that mean? Right? It would mean that there would have to be massive investment, as, as we saw, in generating electricity. Uh, it would mean that every car would have to be called in and remanufactured to make it an electric car. It would mean that the heating system would have to be pulled out of every building and home and an electric one put in. Right? It would mean we would need not one, not two, but three transcontinental high-speed railroads. Uh, that, that, that's what it would mean. And that would be the economic equivalent of World War II. Right? It would have the same beneficial effect. Uh, and, and it could be done just by saying that it will be illegal to burn fossil fuel in 20 years. And not only that, it wouldn't cost anything because we live under capitalism and they could make a profit. Uh, the, the problem is they hate the idea. Uh, so unless we do something of that magnitude, we're not going to get full employment. I, I don't think that the economy has changed. I think the Socialist Party has changed in, in Europe. Uh, I think that in, in, in the 30s, they all thought that they were going to usher in a socialist economy. Right? And, and, and they no longer think that. Now they think that socialists can administer a capitalist economy better than capitalists can. But we can't, because right? it doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, then we get blamed for it. Uh, and that's what keeps moving them more and more in, in the conservative positions, uh, because if they adopt more conservative positions, at least the conservatives can't blame them. And, and meanwhile, they get all those nice jobs sweeping the streets and that kind of thing. Yeah, so my question is kind of related. Um, so the story, I'm very sympathetic to it. seems this is essentially a Keynesian argument, for those who know the economic term, but we want to drive up consumer demand so that it re-stimulates the capitalist growth machine. Now, the story we heard from Francis Fox Pittman last night was much more skeptical of this. Um, so she said that um, she didn't really think Keynesian solutions were the way forward because what we really need to be doing in order, in order to achieve environmental sustainability is go towards a no-growth economy. And I'm sure you've heard this no-growth stuff before. I'm very skeptical of that or much more on the Keynesian camp myself. But I just wanted to see if you could respond to that sort of alternative framework a little bit, because we heard the other story yesterday. Well, there, there, there are certain elements of validity in that also. Uh, now, now, obviously, the kind of program I just outlined of, 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 of the, the greening of the economy uh, would be a high growth uh, approach to the thing. Uh, it, might, it might buy us another uh, century, I'm sorry to say, uh, of, of, uh, of capitalism. It probably wouldn't buy us more. And then the same problems would come back uh, that we have now. They would just come back in a more environmentally friendly way. Right? Because capitalism doesn't work because it keeps generating more wealth and more products that it can't invest and it can't sell. Right? So the, 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 the beauty of the environmental solution is it says everybody has to throw away what they have and get something new. Right? And that's why it, that's why it works. Uh, Ultimately, I, I think that she's right, but ultimately is very ultimate. Uh, ultimately, you, you need to get to a, a more sustainable situation that isn't dependent on growth. The problem is you can't do that under capitalism. Right? The, the, the nature of capitalism is that it has to grow, it can't stand still. But right? if it stands still, it starts to break down. And, 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 and we, we, we see that uh, all the time. Right, all of that wealth has to be reinvested. Now, it, it, there's no law that says it has to be reinvested, but that is what's in their heads. That's what's in the heads of the economics departments. Anybody who doesn't reinvest it gets fired, and they hire somebody who will try. Uh, so, so it, it, the, the, gro the growth is built into the psychology of capitalism in a self-perpetuating way. Uh, and it's not until there is a massive re-education of those people that doesn't have to be done in camps, but it wouldn't hurt 
Uh, <laughs> Oh, that we can get to a, uh, a sustainable situation, which I think under socialism we could. I, I, I know that there's a break now. We've got one more minute. We'll take one last question. Oh, this, is a, this is a quick point as well. All right. um, I just want to say thank you. This is a very great and entertaining slideshow. I really loved it. Uh, the one thing, a suggestion, I guess, is that in the beginning of the slideshow, you had there were three social movements that go to build the middle class when you listen to civil rights, women's, and labor movement. And I would say that you're missing one. I think there's a fourth social movement that when it was integral in fueling the left in the early 20th century and will be necessary for building a new middle class, which is immigration, um, immigrate mass movements into the country, immigration movements, and also immigration right movements as a social movement. No, I've, I've thought about that. Uh, I don't think that there has been an immigration movement that has functioned at the level of the other three with that kind of success. Uh, now, for a long time, the industrial union movement was also an immigration movement. Right? That, that's, that's who the unskilled... The leftists, the leftists were coming from here as well. Yeah, of course. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we could put it in, but I, I think to be historically precise about it, it hasn't quite happened yet. <laughs> Or, or else we're in the middle of it. Yeah, it's another, you see it happening right now. It's, yeah, I mean, it's happening around us. And, and you know, ho hopefully, uh, uh, I, I would love to add it, uh, but, but I, I, I don't want to do it prematurely just for historical accuracy. Anybody who wants this, who has a, a thumb drive, uh, can have this presentation. There's no reason why you can't do it as well as I can do it. Uh, okay, thank you all.